Well, I mean, we at Gottfried TV, uh, Gottfried and Gottfried TV basically um, looked at those around us that were already doing it. You know, guys like DJ Wheat um, at ITG, guys at TSN, um, you know, and those guys had started doing audio only, like literally shoutcasting, which is where you use the shoutcast server. You connected yourself to it, the fans connected to it, and they listened to you while they then synced the in-game um, spectator tools, whether it was Quake or Counter-Strike. And we, you know, uh, we started Gafrag, and that, that process was already happening. There was already like audio, like uh, commentary going. And we got pretty, pretty darn good at uh, our written coverage to the point where like we were kind of the best people covering Counter-Strike in a written form. But we, we got to the point where we were like, well, we should, if we're the ESPN of, uh, of Counter-Strike and of eSports, then we have, to, we have to continue this, right? So we looked at what they were all doing. We looked at the gear that they had bought, um, TriCasters and these kind of things, because they had then slowly moved to video. And we went, well, this is our next step, right? ESPN now broadcasts games. They don't just cover games. So we did that. We, uh, we started out with uh, this badass unit called, uh, it's called a VT5 back then, but it's made by NewTek. It's now what's called the TriCaster. And it's basically a production level um, as they sell at a TV station in a box. So uh, in modern terms, if you think of a PC that's just jacked full of capture cards and audio and video capture cards and then software that lets you manipulate all those inputs and put fancy graphics and transitions on it um, and make a beautiful show, uh, you know, we purchased one of those. Again, both TSN and ITG had already had one. Um, and then, we, again, we looked at exactly what they were doing and said, how do we do it better, right? Um, we thought that we were the experts in Counter-Strike. Often our writers and our like, guys like Midway and Jesuit, uh, Midway, one of the owners of Godfrag, would be you know, color commentary and play-by-play -play on, these, on these streams, right? And so we're like, well, we've got the talent. They can talk about the game. Uh, let's go ahead and do it ourselves, right? So we went and bought TriCasters. And the one thing that... Uh, my buddy and I, Alchemist, who uh, I did, didn't do this alone, Alchemist yeah. and I were, uh, were side by side in all of this. You know, we, we spent many, you know, about a year plus looking at what they were doing and, you know, how do we do it better? What, how much will it cost? And the, one of the first things that jumped out to us was we need to take the uh, camera control away from the, broad, the, the casters themselves. And that was standard for all games, right? Where the guy at the desk doing the talking was also basically driving the spectator feed that was going to the production, which was what everybody saw, right? That works A-OK -okay with a game like Quake, right? Because there's only two guys to be on. No one was worried about cinematic third-person fly-throughs or anything. So, you know, when they're doing Quake, it's perfect, right? That's even, actually even better because those guys are keeping an eye on, like, cool, you know, the, the power-ups and all the different things. But for Counter-Strike, so much action, 10 guys spread out of two bomb sites, a mini-map, all these different things to worry about in the big map. Um, we quickly realized that like our guys and like basically nobody in, in Counter-Strike should be driving themselves. It's just, it's just really hard, right, to keep your own like storyline as a caster and then like, oh, I'm on a dead guy. Like we, you know, you'd always hear, dead guy, dead guy, dead guy. And that was to tell the caster, you're on a dead guy still because he's, he's in the middle of a rant or he's talking about something and he, he forgets that he's also the camera guy. So we immediately like, how do we do this? Well, we have a TriCaster. It has multiple inputs. So we set up very similar to what we see now. Like our observer had five screens. Right, and in Alchemist was our in-game director and I was our overall director, so I worried about getting us in-game and then he took over. And we had four uh, computers that were dedicated to either uh, third-person fly-through th fly areas, you know, like over catwalk on desk two or something, and then uh, those would also mix up with POV, so always put one on the bomb carrier, always put one on the CT who you think is the, the guy that's gonna get the first kills. And then we had a fifth one that was literally just a laptop that always had the map blown up. It helped, so production could see it perfectly. It was right in front of Alchemist, so he could manage the action, but then we could always go to it really quick and without having to use the other four, right? And at the same time, we also put regular PCs in front of the casters so they could get into the, the, the in-game spectator and do whatever they wanted, right? Because they didn't want to look at money. They want to go to a different bomb site that, that we're not showing. And then we'd put the program freed right in the middle so they would see what the world was seeing so they would know what to talk about, right? And it, and it kind of, I, I don't know if we were the very first, because obviously guys were doing stuff in Europe. Um, I, we definitely, I think, were the first in North America to kind of really wrestle it away from the casters. And then we had, you know, we had a TriCaster that did all these cool things. So we're like, okay, what else can we do that no one's doing? Um, I think we were the first to do instant replay. Uh, and I think that blew, blew people's mind when we rolled replay for the first time. They're like, whoa, how did they do that, right? And again, TriCaster was able to do that. You could, you could chop what you're recording and it would flip it right into a, a DDR for you to play. You could throw transitions on it and boom, instant replay. Now we were limited at that point. You were replaying what you had already seen, right? It was the program feed. And now 
they're, they're recording all different stuff, more like sports where you, you see all these angles of the play, right? We, we definitely weren't doing that. You know, and we took like a, a crappy little tablet and figured out how to put up just a map graphic on it and basic drawing tools and get that in the TriCaster. And it was kind of a jerry-rigged telestrator. So Midway could break down some strats. Now, of course, uh, you know, you can live telestrate over the game. There's, the people are buying telestration tools. Yes, but again, we, right. yeah, and you know, there's all different ways they're doing it now. Um, <laughs> so I think we were one of the first to actually kind of like jam that into the broadcast, you know. Um, I don't know if we were the first, but I, I know we were definitely right there with a lot of this stuff. I mean, I think we're well on, uh, on the way to uh, rivaling in a lot of regards, you know, how sports does their broadcast. We're very similar now. The gear is very similar. Hell, in some of these events, the actual same TV trucks that, uh, that pull up uh, to the NFL games are, are being rented and being used by some of these big production companies, you know? Um, so, and and it, it's some of the crews. Like, I've done some, um, some stuff for different companies when I was doing some broadcast stuff, and I was in TV trucks with TV guys. So when I was explaining to them, the, the nuances, uh, you know, it's just like what you guys are used to, but just a little different, right? Um, and they end up, like, by the end of the week, they're like, oh, my God, this is actually cooler than doing a golf tournament. This is cooler than doing a football game, right? Um, and so I think the gear is catching up because uh, we have the budgets to now do it. You know, back in the day, it was like, okay, how do we take the cheapest stuff and somehow make it look good, right? Um, and now, again, the budgets are growing. We're in arenas, right? So that dictates a level of broadcast out of the building that needs to rival what you see in sports, right? I think, I think we're seeing a shift to uh, story-driven, uh, a lot more player, behind the scenes, background, that kind of stuff. I think at the start it was like, let's just make sure we show the game really, really good, right? And now everyone's gotten really good at that. And again, much like sports, they've nailed showing matches of whatever sport. But it's all that shoulder content that, you know, obviously you're a fan of a sport, you watch the matches. But what really kind of grabs you and locks you in is learning about that player, you know, that athlete's journey, that Dota player's journey, that Counter-Strike guy's journey. Because that, that bonds you to the guy, not just, uh, you know, the sport and the team he plays on. And so, again, once you get this technology down, then you start working on, okay, well, let's fly and interview the players. You know, obviously Valve's notorious with their player bios for these different games that, you know, make you laugh, make you cry. Uh, you know, it reminds me of, like when you watch the Olympics, right? Oftentimes, the Olympics uh, for some of these broadcasters are less about the sport. Sometimes the sports are very obscure. A lot of the fans globally don't know about them. But where they'll hook those people is when they tell you that at 12, this guy got kicked out of his house and all these different things. And then all of a sudden, you're like, whoa, this guy's journey. Yeah, maybe he's judo, maybe he's volleyball, maybe he's basketball. But like, you connect on a human level, right? And I think, we're, again, as budgets grow, we're getting a lot more of what we call shoulder content, right? Um, and I think that really, it humanizes what we do. It takes away this stigma that, oh, it's just a bunch of fat nerds playing video games. I mean, look on the stage, not very many fat nerds playing at this level, right? Um, and, and, and again, it, what it also helps is obviously the, the, the inherent fan loves it, right? Because they're getting more info. But then when, it, uh, when, it, when a new person tunes in, it, it looks even more like the sports they're used to. Oh, they're doing a player segment. Oh, they're doing, you know, all these different things. It all matches up, right? Because that's what we all look at in this industry. Everyone looks at sports, whether it's production-wise, whether it's team owner-wise, whether it's tournament organized. We're, we know we're different, but at the same time, like, that's kind of our, it's kind of like sports and business. It's kind of like sports and athletics. Let's head that way. But then we have a, a, a lot to shift because we're different, right? I think you, you have to find a mix, you know, and I think, I think one thing that we nail that they can't nail is we go inside the game, right? Like you watch a, uh, you know, you watch a, a basketball game and, you know, you've got certain camera shots and all, you know, they're close-ups and they're the court overall, but you never see LeBron's perspective running down the court, right? Slamming, jamming, all those things. Every one of our esports, for the most part, is first person or you know, MOBAs are different, obviously, right? That would be more like traditional, right? You're looking down on the field. But like games like this, like you know, you're, you spend more, most of your time in eyes of someone. So now I'm a player at home, and I'm an opera, but I'm a terrible opera. Well, when I see these world-class operas, I'm learning stuff, right? I'm like, oh, that's how he holds the angle. Oh, that's how he gets away from the smoke. You know, it's not quite the same if you're a high school quarterback and you're watching an NFL match. You don't get that same perspective because, again, if you could see what the quarterback truly is looking at, that'd be a whole different perspective, right? And where it's closest is NASCAR went nuts with like car cameras and dash cameras and all this different stuff because they wanted the fans to feel like they were in the race car, right? And so that's kind of the closest sport, but like, and obviously most like 
football players aren't going to let you put a GoPro on their head and stuff, right? So I think that's going to be our advantage for a really, really long time, is that we actually get in the game on a lot of these games. Um, I, think, I think you have to be really careful with it. Um, I mean, obviously, the fans love to hear the communication, right? They absolutely, are, again, it's, it's getting them inside that game, right? And so on a pure fan level of like entertainment, yeah, doing listen-ins and hearing the, the comms is great. But, and, you know, and uh, sports do that in a, in a, in a variety of ways, right? Um, but they're generally monitored, right? So if you don't monitor what these guys are saying, like maybe they swear a lot, maybe they, maybe they do use like unsavory language to the average user, but that's how they communicate and that's how they win, right? And you, you, you don't want to unintentionally damage anyone's brand or their team's brand, their owner's brand, because one guy is so mad that he starts dropping expletives that technically, you know, no one should hear, but his teammates and his teammates are used to hearing that. Now, if all the players are aware of it and they accept it, um, that's okay in some regards, like, hey, we got all their approval, they know to watch what they're saying, but now you're changing what they, what, how, they, how they interact. So now, do I have to always think in my head, okay, well, do, I, do, I, do I have to take that brief millisecond to temper myself, right? Um, you know, in different esports, people do listen-ins. I know for a while uh, in Counter-Strike, we had full POVs, and where it gets trouble with the full POV during a live tournament is it's too much valuable information that you're giving the opponent. And that's, the players are actually less worried about like saying the wrong thing than being scouted, right? Um, and especially the English speaking players, right? So, you, you know, you got eight teams at a tournament, and if these were all live and they did, uh, they did long enough listen-ins that there was strategy involved, then teams would go home and listen to them, right? Um, and they would use them to their advantage. And, I, and so I don't know, and that just, I don't want to call it cheating, but it's kind of unfair scouting, I think, right? Um, yeah, now a little listen-ins, and if you could figure out a way to do a listen-in and maybe the players know about it for that brief second, like, uh, but again, like, I, I don't think you want to do anything to disrupt their flow, exactly. right? Um, now, after the fact, you know, um, after the fact, the strat thing goes away, like next month if the POVs drop, uh, the teams are less worried about it, right? Because again, strats change all the time, right? It's, it's literally the next day you're worried about. So that, that solves that issue of like getting, getting stratted, but then it still doesn't solve the issue of what the guy said and you know, the, the, the content. Um, so it's just that, it's that fine line. And I don't know, you know, uh, I think some esports, you know, definitely define how it works. And it, you know, we've basically gone away from it in Counter-Strike. I think it, they'd rather err on the benefit of the players being safe, if you will, and no drama than that little extra piece of fan information, right? And maybe, you know, maybe one day we figure it out. Like, a guy comes in, everyone's here, hey, we're about to do a listen in, just so you know. But then if I'm in the middle of my game, it's like, I don't need to hear that, right? So it's, just, it's a tough, it's a tough, it's a tough one because the fans love it, right? No doubt about it. I love hearing it because you're like, oh. Because exactly. when, you're, when, you're, when you're home, you think a strat went south for one reason or another or something one for another thing, and you might misinterpret what happened. But if you hear those comms, you have that next level of information of like, oh, he called that rotation early. He shouldn't have. You know, and that's why that guy moved. Someone told him to move. Um, but again, uh, it's a tough one, right?